Have you heard about it? Have you experienced it? Have you felt the presence of God? Have you seen the move of God? Thanksgiving is signing up for the next season. Thanksgiving is inviting God for another breakthrough. Isaac had no vision. Isaac was not hardworking. Isaac did not succeed. Isaac received a mantle. You are a son in the kingdom of God. Become a witness of Christ. And today I want us to refer to the book of Psalms 51, a common scripture known by all of us. Knowing God is key. Knowing God is the principle behind our discussion this week. Psalms 51 from verses, let's begin from verses 10. Create in me a clean heart, O Lord, or God, and renew a right spirit or a steadfast spirit within me. When somebody says renew, it means there was a state before lost courtesy of what we'll be discussing. So he's asking to be renewed to what was. So renew my spirit, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right and steadfast spirit within me. And then it goes further to say, do not cast me away from your presence. So the emphasis is, with this kind of the heart, your presence will be foreign. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And sustain me with a willing spirit. The knowledge of God is built within a human desire for God. The knowledge of God is built within a human desire. It is within the heart of a man to know God. It is within the spirit of a man to know God. It's within the longing of the heart of a man to know God. The spirit of man longs for the creator. The spirit of man longs for God. It's not something foreign. It's not something we are trying to create. It is within the redemption of man to desire God. The spirit of man born of the spirit of God has a hunger, a desire, a longing for its source, which is God. It ought to be so obvious that a born again believer is hungry for God. Because by salvation your spirit becomes alive towards God. It is therefore within that understanding that it should be expected that the spirit born of God longs for God. Because the spirit of man by redemption is born of God. It is therefore expected that the birth of the spirit of man from the spirit of God creates a hunger in the spirit of man to its source, which is God. It will be foreign then that the spirit of man, born by the spirit of God, has no hunger for God. 
It's foreign. It's strange. It's, it's, it's questionable that the spirit of man, born of the spirit of God, has no hunger for God. Like a plant planted on soil or on earth, springing up without the hunger and the joy and the desire for the connection with the earth or with soil. As long as a tree or a plant loses its joy, hunger, and passion for its connection with soil, it surely would die. It is expected, therefore, that the spirit or the spirit of a man regenerated by God becomes a life towards God. And therefore, the desire to know God becomes part of the heartbeat of a man born of God. It is therefore questionable that a man born of God, a spirit born of God, seems to rebel God, has no desire for God, has no longing for God, has no pursuit for God, because that would question who then occupies. For example, it says, therefore, our, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God indwells in us. So that means God the Holy Spirit, who is the administrator of the church, the manager of the souls of men, living in us is not felt by us. Our spirit does not click the spirit of God. So the first thing I want you to consider is, it's expected that the spirit of man, born of the spirit of God, should naturally have a hunger, a longing, a desire to know God. Without saying much on that, it is expected that the spirit of man, born of the spirit of God, should naturally long for God. For, for this is the point. When a seed is planted on the soil, its passion and desire is to become a tree. The desire to become, or let's use the potential for the right word, the potential to become a tree is not just within the seed. It is a call from the mother tree. The realization of the mother tree, the growth of the mother tree, the fruitfulness of the mother tree is a call to the seedling to realize the potential which it was born from. It is therefore expected that the seed of God in man is always prompted by the intensity of God's greatness to become like its source. Am I making sense? If, if a child is born, there is a low potential to match the height the, 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 the height, the, 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 the growth, and the attainment of its originality. Isn't that? There? there is something called, the, is, is it a slow or low syndrome? There's a syndrome where a child does not, what do you call it? Down syndrome, I call it low. Down syndrome, where a child becomes a dwarf. You, you don't outgrow, you, you don't attain. One of the concerns that was, is with every parent, I remember one day we had, uh, I think we had a Holy Communion or something, and uh, I said in the church, if, if you have a child that has, has, has outgrown the age where they ought to walk and, and talk and nothing is happening, I want you to pick part of the Holy Communion and give it to them. And the family literally did that and reached reach out to the Sunday school and requested for their baby who had outgrown, overstayed without walking and talking. And so they brought the baby and gave the baby the Holy Communion. And in the mo at night, I think the child turned around. The baby had overstayed. The baby could not walk. So the baby turned from the bed. And when the parent was conscious about the baby turning from the bed, they had the baby talking. Amen. And in the morning, the baby, the mother went to prepare breakfast and the baby walked to the kitchen. What is that? There is a potential, there is a longing. That's why you see a small child begin to speak without being, without, even without teaching them. There is a longing for them to say something. There is a longing to walk. That's why they roll around, fall around. Because there is a call from the potential within to match that desired position of a man. 
there is a call from the mother tree for the seedling to match it. It is expected, therefore, that the seed of God represents God in the heart of a man. So the call in the heart of a man sh should be to mature and become like that seed. It should be like a plant planted under a shed. Or have you seen the way plants break rocks, break walls, move, turn around to avert obstacles and limitations and restrictions? Because the potential in them says there is something we want to become and nothing can restrict us. That should be what the seed of God in the heart of a man longs for. I want you to write this statement down. The seed of God in man is actually God. The seed of man, I mean of God in man, is actually God. So there is a God in you longing to become the God that planted the seed. Therefore, a man's knowledge of God, locked up in his spiritual life, should trigger the hunger and thirst for God. I repeat again, the word of God locked or the knowledge of God locked within the heart of a man should trigger the hunger and the thirst for God. The knowledge of God in the heart of a man should quicken a man to desire more God. Amen. I think I need to emphasize that. Yes. There can never be a knowledge of God that doesn't create a hunger for God. So when we say, I know God, when you receive a word from God, it should trigger the hunger for God. Why? The knowledge of God should draw you closer to God. The knowledge of God should create a hunger to know him better. The beauty about God is that our walk with God is like our appetite. The sweeter the food, the more you want to go to it again. Talk to me. Even if you are satisfied tonight, Tomorrow morning you are hungry and you want to eat again. Even if you are not to eat for two, three days, but after the third day, the hunger has taken charge of your life and you want to eat again. And your hunger will always lead you to the place where you are satisfied initially. The knowledge of God should trigger the hunger for God. The knowledge for God should trigger the hunger for God. How do we say you know God? By the hunger you exhibit about God. Now, why is that important? Because you can never exhaust God. You cannot know him fully. You cannot finish him, if that is the right word. You cannot say, I have known God. The more you know God, the more you are hungry for God. The more you want to know God, the more you know God, the more you realize there is a depth in God that you need to know. And I think Paul puts it well. He says, I consider all that I've achieved of no value for the excellence of what he said before him. He says that I may know him better. Now, if Paul says, I want to know him better, then there is a dimension in God that needs to be discussed. Yeah. Because some of us are still struggling to catch up with Paul. Paul is saying, with all that you are struggling to understand about my experience with God, I have really exhausted that curriculum is past. It's obsolete. It's overtaken by time. I want to know him better. Yeah. And this has been the discussion from Genesis to Revelation. What are the transitions and the changes and the seasons from Genesis to Revelation? Is that God has been revealing himself in pits and uh, pieces, in symbols and events and activities and, and, um, and rituals. But, but it is the same God who has been trying to reveal himself more and more until the coming of Christ and climax by the coming of the Holy Spirit who came now to impregnate our spirit with the spirit of God so the egg of our heart the egg you understand what I mean the egg which would represent the egg in the womb of a woman is now impregnated by the seed of the word of God and now what is expected is for the seed of God to form God inside the womb of a um, So every word from God is a seed from God yes. targeting the sperm of your, I mean the, the egg of your potential. Yes. And therefore when you receive the word from God, we should see some development. Amen. 
And the development cannot be anything other than the real expression of what you conceived. And I don't want to use a wrong language, but if you conceive from a man, we don't expect to see chicken after nine months. That is simple enough. And we don't, we don't expect hair that after nine months there was nothing. And we don't expect a piece of wood. And we don't expect a giraffe. We expect exactly what you conceived. Even if the nose doesn't look like, the blood must. Talk to me. Yeah. You, you know, recently, a friend of mine, a pastor, you know, some of these things are personal revelation. You know, they were praying in the church and um, the, the Holy Spirit in prayer, one of the brothers in that says us in the church, he said, God had showed him a demon that was coming to church. But the demon was a white man. So, so he was telling me, we have discovered that they are white demons. <laughs> if you hear it in English, Swahili is very interesting. Ati aliona pepo msungu. So I laughed over it. The other day we met and I reminded him. Kamulisa, ile pepo msungu alifika. And true to that, in their simplicity, true to that, a pastor friend from some place somewhere walked into their service with a musungu. And the proposal was, this musungu of mine has something, they support pastors, but the condition is you must surrender your church so that we change the name, remove the signpost, you must receive the new constitution, I mean, you must have a new constitution, and everything in this church must be now given to this ministry because they will give you double the value of your assets. Sama tuliona pepo musungu. The conception of the seed of God is expected that after nine months you give birth to God. I'm thinking so. If you conceive love, if you conceive a word of faith, if you conceive a word of healing, if you conceive a word of prosperity, if you conceive the word of grace, if you conceive the knowledge of Christ, we expect like Mary Mary conceived, and I think the Holy Spirit was trying to paint a picture. Mary conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the thing she conceived was holy. And after nine months, she gave birth to God. Are you here? And this so I may know him. In experience, becoming more and thoroughly acquainted with him understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely. And in that same way, experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows and is active in believers, in, in active in believers uh, and that I may share the fellowship of his suffering. Suffering here is no longer a negative word. Suffering by being continually conformed inwardly in his likeness, even to his death, dying as he did. Christ died of one thing and resurrected of another. I, and I, I, it, it brings to my mind what the Bible says, some seed fell on good soil, some fell on a thorny ground, some fell on a rocky ground, and some fell by the roadside. I pray therefore that your heart is that good soil that when the seed of God is deposited in you, when he comes for the harvest, he will find the harvest. So it is expected that a man's knowledge of God locked up within his spirit should trigger the hunger of God. And, and I'm going somewhere with this. Because ladies and gentlemen, it beats logic to have God, to receive God's word, to be born again, to have the spirit of God, and have no desire, no longing for God. Something is amiss somewhere. 
Knowing God, therefore, should trigger more love for God. The knowledge of God, the more you know God, that should enhance the love for God. The more you know God, the more you should lose the joy of God. Atu unampenda mungu sana, unamjua mungu sana kiasi kwamba umpendi. It's expected therefore that the knowledge of God informs the love for God. So your love for God is an exhibition of your knowledge of God. Huh? It's expected that the, the, the knowledge of God triggers the love for God. Knowing God therefore is exhibited by the love you have for God. Number three, the knowledge of God should trick a joy. The joy, what David calls the joy of salvation. And the joy of salvation, according to David, is not the joy of being assured of going to heaven. It's the joy of the experience and the consciousness of the presence of God. Am I making sense? So, so the, the knowledge of God should trick the joy of God. Now, there is this scripture that we talk about most of the time in the book of Luke. Chapter 10, where, where, where I think it's from verses 33, 34, 35, 36, somewhere there. This was, a, this was a, a, an event, an occasion where Jesus walks into the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And the Bible says when he walked into, into the home, uh, Mother remained at, at the kitchen cooking for, for, for the guests. But Mary decided to go and sit at the feet of Christ. And at some point, Mother complained that... Um, why, why is Mary sitting with the guest while we're supposed to, 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 to feed the guest? And Jesus said, you know what, Martha, you, you are concerned with so many things, but Mary has chosen the most important one. Now, sometimes when we read that scripture, we completely disregard Mother and say, Mother is, is in the flesh. You know, Mother was doing protocol. It's like they are more concerned about food. But, but, but listen. The principle of food is an attribute of fellowship. They were there fellowshipping over a meal. Now, now listen, before you misquote Christ, Christ did not completely rubbish the work assignment of mother. Actually, I look at it from the original translation, and what it means is Mary has decided based on priority. What she pursued was priority. Not because what mother was doing was unnecessary. Jesus was their guest. It's the same one that says I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's the same one that ate bread in the house of Abraham and Isaac came out of that. It's the same God who has expressed himself through fellowship. It's the one who fed who did some protocol work by feeding them with his blood and his body. Jesus was saying, Mary has established priority. She has picked what informs the other. Yes. Am I talking to you? Yes. He was saying, what Mary is doing should inform service. Service should not inform worship. You should not win me you should not approach me through service. You should serve through adoration and worship and acknowledgement. It should be my presence that informs your service. It should not be your service that informs my presence. So I don't want you to impress me with service. I want you to serve with my presence. Amen. So he did not rubbish. Because the knowledge of God informs our service to God. Write that down. The knowledge of God informs our service to God. This is very important. The knowledge of God informs our service to God. Now let me dwell there for a moment. What was the concern of David? David had fallen into sin. You remember the sin of David? He had had an affair with um, Bathsheba. Bathsheba, Bathsheba, Bathsheba who was the wife of Uriah, and then finally killed Uriah, and then finally he fasted for the restoration, preservation of the life of the baby, and then finally the baby dies. The death of that baby was God's sign of restoration to Abraham. I mean, yes. 
David. God killed what would have been a mark of sin in the life of David. Anybody who accuses David of adultery does not understand that the sin of David died. Ukifika pinguni anda uliza Daudi kwamba breaking kam kama ya leo tulikuwa na kudiscuss. David fell into adultery. But the product of his sin when he fasted in repentance God killed the product of his sin. So according to the files of David, what we accuse him of doesn't exist. But that's not our focus tonight. David says, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. The joy of salvation informs the experience of David's relationship with God. Now come with me. The joy of salvation informs the experience of David with God. The experience of David with God was in his assignment. David was a king. His sense of assignment, his experience with God was in the service on the throne. The knowledge of God informs the joy of service. Write it down. The knowledge of God informs the joy of service. So knowing God informs serving God. Because the knowledge of God is an equipping grace to serve the God you know. And that's why he said, where my servant is, there I am. God, listen the knowing or the knowledge of God is the equipping of a believer to serve God in knowledge. It is the equipping of a believer to build the experience or to build the environment for an experience. If the knowledge of God does not lead you to serve God, then the knowledge of God has no meaning. The climax of the knowledge of God is in serving God. Let's prove it. Every man in the Bible that knew God, served God at the level of their knowledge of God. Amen. The intensity of their service was in the intimacy of their knowledge. Nobody served God beyond their knowledge of God. And nobody denounced service because of knowing God. The knowledge of God empowers you to serve God. You shall receive power. Then you will be my witness. You shall receive power. Then you will be my witness. Let's put this into perspective. We have nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. We talks about the identity of a believer. Those are the terms of our engagement. Those are the etiquettes of our relationship. Those are what we call, um, th those are the principles of our culture. We relate on the nine fruit of the Spirit. Isn't that? Love your neighbor. Be patient with your neighbor. That is our culture. We don't kill each other. We don't give up on each other because we have a culture. We have the etiquettes of the spirit. We have the principles of the spirit. When your brother forgives, I mean, hurts you or offend you, forgive them, reach out to them. You know what I'm talking about. But the nine gift of the Holy Spirit is to propagate the God we know. Listen to me. Nobody will know the God you don't represent in service. We make God known by serving him. And listen, ladies and gentlemen, the highest privilege in life is to serve God. It's a privilege to serve God. It's a privilege to serve God. Knowing God, therefore, David is saying, with sin, I have lost the consciousness of God. The consciousness of God is, I can no longer hear God. I can no longer see his leading. I can no longer hear his voice. And therefore, I can no longer serve him. Let's look at it this way. David inquired of the Lord of everything he did. What we would consider today as an official responsibility of a king. But even going to war, 
David inquired of the Lord. 